Hello everyone, I am Boz, I'm the CTO of Meta, and I'm joined today by our Chief Scientist, Michael Abrash. Welcome, Michael, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is your 10th Connect, is that right? Uh, inconceivably, the answer is yes, it is my 10th Connect. Can you tell me, what, is, what was it like to you at the first Connect? Because I wasn't there. Well, the first Connect was actually one of the more remarkable experiences of my life. Um, the energy around it, the buzz, I mean, it hadn't been clear to me at all how many people were really excited about this whole VR thing. You know, it had really been an under the radar kind of small group of people. And walking out on that stage that first time and seeing like all those people who were really excited about what they thought the future was going to be. And they were right. Um, and also personally, it was a unique experience because I never really talked to a crowd like that before. And uh, finding mm -hmm. that I could get up in front of all those people and not be so nervous that I couldn't talk. And, you know, what I really realized was this wasn't like people who were judging me. There were people who wanted to hear what I wanted to, had to say. They wanted to hear about where the future was going. And uh, it was just a great experience. Well, that's what we're here to talk about today. And I will tell a little personal anecdote. Uh, is that Michael is the reason uh, I do the work that I do today. Uh, now, certainly, Mark Zuckerberg made a strong pitch for me to, to join up and do this work. And if you know Mark, that's saying something. He makes strong pitches for a living. Um, but it, he wasn't the decider. It was my conversation with Michael uh, who really convinced me not only that I uh, could do this work and be of some value, which I was skeptical of, uh, but also that this was work that would not happen on its own. Uh, it would take the consistent application of force from people who believed in it to make it happen. First, uh, I'll say the phrase that I really like for that is the myth of technological inevitability, is that later, when you look mm -hmm. back on things from decades later, it's like, well, of course, how else could it have happened? It would have happened no matter what. But while it's happening, people make it happen. Specific people, specific choices get made in specific paths. And, you know, mm -hmm. we, we are making that happen. And the people who are coming to connect are really, that's the community that's making it real. So why don't you help us out? Talk people through what that vision is. What is that vision that we have been pursuing collectively now for more than a decade? It actually took me a few years to really fully understand this. And to explain it, I want to go back 50 years to Xerox Park, the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, and the development of the first personal computer. What they put together there in the form of the Alto really was the world that we live in today. 2D surfaces with bitmap graphics, a pointing device and a keyboard, and they also invented ethernet. They invented the laser printer, WYSIWYG word processing, object-oriented programming, really the full package. And for the last half century, we've been living in the world they created. Mm -hmm. That is a super powerful world, obviously. For example, anybody listening to this, I guarantee you have a supercomputer in your pocket or in your purse. Right? Every single one of us does. We don't even have to ask. That's how much they change the world. But it's only a partial step towards the real vision. And the real vision is a world in which we can mix real and virtual in any way we want to serve our needs, to, to meet our goals. And that is the thing that we're creating, where we can drive our perceptions and allow us to act in the way we do in the real world. You have laid out and have been working on for a long time now a bunch of research areas, the areas that you feel the status quo, the technology that we have today is insufficient to deliver in its completion. What are the key research areas that you've been focused on uh, most lately? Yeah, that's a great point. That one thing I'll I'll point out is that we all grew up in a world of Moore's Law. We always knew there was going to be more compute next year. And the platforms have been consistent since Xerox Park in the sense of, again, 2D surface pointing device keyboard. So that has kind of gotten us used to a world in which really everything's a software problem and the platform underneath it only changes in incremental ways. But what we're talking about here is really a change all the way from the bottom, where the hardware, the software, the applications all will evolve over time into much more powerful forms. You keep talking about the, 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 the input modalities, this touching the keyboard and the pointing device. And, you know, these were things that were highly contentious in the 50, 1950s and 1960s. Uh, you know, what were going to be the methodologies that people were going to use to get information to the computer? We since kind of 
zoomed in on one, sure, we replaced the mouse for direct touch in the case of touch screens, but otherwise, we've been incredibly consistent for a long time, and those modalities just don't work in augmented and virtual reality. Um, and so that's another area that, that is such a key piece that's so different from the previous generation of technology. Absolutely. In fact, that may end up being the most fundamental aspect of all, which is when you're walking around the world, you're not going to be popping up menus and pointing at them, right? You're not going to be tapping on surfaces all the time. What you want is you want the right thing to happen when you want it to happen. And that really comes down to a combination of being able to sense the world around you, of understanding your context, of having AI that can make sense of that to help you, and then of having this ultra low friction input that lets you act easily, intuitively, anytime, any place. All those pieces need to come together. So that's one of the big things that we have been working on developing. And we've talked many times publicly about EMG, electromyography, which I think is the future of how we will interact with the virtual world. It's something that lets us monitor the nerve impulses and small muscle movements in our wrists so that we can easily, um, privately, and with high bandwidth, interact with the digital world. For me, at least, this input story is an AI story. It's not just the sensing that you need uh, on the, the wrist, uh, ideally, to, to uh, detect those signals. It's also the artificial intelligence required to decode those, um, have enough of a general model that the entire population can get started, and then be able to personalize that model. Uh, and we're talking about something called co-evolution, which is, was foundational in the very earliest user interfaces being designed at Stanford Research Institute, was this idea of co-evolution. But it was so hard to do back then um, that basically almost all the evolution had to happen on the side of the consumer. The machine couldn't really help. And with today's AI powers, we can actually really help uh, adapt these models to each individual in the same way that we adapt people's news feeds to their personal preferences. Exactly. And you know, a way to think about it is that when you click on an icon on a screen, it feels like, well, it's just a simple action, but there's a huge amount of context that goes into it. What application are you running? What icon is it? You, it funnels down your awareness into the one place you want to make the choice so you can do it with one single one-bit action, basically. In the real world, that's much harder, right? The real world is way more complex. But what you can imagine is that that contextual AI that you were talking about actually does that scoping for you. So again, you can use EMG to simply pick the thing that you want as opposed to having to sort through all the possibilities. Um, so EMG all the way from the bottom up, you know, doing recognizing the nerve signals, customizing for each person, and then putting it all together to help you meet your goals. And the customizing for each person is a really interesting thing. Imagine that you had a keyboard that actually moved around under your fingers to be for what you meant to type, as opposed to forcing you to hit the keys where they are. That's how you can think of this co-evolution um, of how we're going to be doing input. It will learn you, you will learn it. It will be as efficient as it can possibly be. Yeah, one of the things that we've shared recently was a demo of a keyboard that uh, you do where it's computer vision of my hands, and but there's no actual keyboard. And what was interesting about that was when I was trying to pretend there were keys, I typed much slower. And when I just typed where I thought the keys should have been for my hands, and because of this type of adaptive uh, artificial intelligence and the way we trained that model, I was able to move it, uh, type at much higher speeds, uh, which is a pretty incredible breakthrough if you think about it, uh, that how much I was having to adapt my hands to a keyboard that was designed for everybody whose hands might be smaller, bigger, different places in mind relative to my body. So there's a tremendous opportunity for this to be computing that's not only seamless and integrated, but also much more comfortable and much more accessible. So I love that example. And it's very specifically because the reason that it works so well for you once you stop trying to hit the keys is because what the machine learning is actually doing is it's trying to figure out the intent of what your finger motion is. It's not trying to figure out what mm -hmm. key you're hitting. It's saying, if you do this motion, I think that would be hitting the key M, for example. And so, it was now bypassing this intermediate step of forcing you into that mold and was simply saying, what's your intent? And the more that we have machine learning that can understand our intent, the more intuitive the world gets. Now, some of these things are a little farther away. Um, certainly EMG is one that we're making a lot of progress on, but it still has a lot of more progress to be made. But some of these pieces are, are coming up much closer. You know, we're announcing here at Connect, we're rolling out smart glasses that have um, an AI assistant on them. Um, that alone is, I think, something that 
will be uh, meaningful for people. Can you talk through how you uh, think about the importance of AI to how these systems interact with us as people? Well, I certainly can. And to, to go back to sort of the beginning, for a long time, what we've been working towards is making the glasses basically platforms that extend your perception, that extend your memory, even extend your cognition, help you think through things. And in order to do that, the first thing they need to do is to be able to be on when you need them to be on. So we're working on basically sensors that can work in all conditions, that work on low power, that can be basically aware of your context. And then on top of that, the idea was you would have AI with this lo very low friction input. But a year ago, the answer about, well, what AI would have been, well, it's a research problem. Yeah. Now, right. LLMs have come along and they've answered that question, is that you put an LLM there and you make it multimodal as you described so that it can actually understand context. And all of a sudden you have this interface that can start to act proactively on your behalf they can start to anticipate your needs, they can scope down your choices, they can just make your life go more easily. Artificial intelligence is deep in many of the things that we do. We talked about computer vision. Computer vision was largely an artificial intelligence problem. We used, you know, tremendous amount of training data and machine learning. Um, one of my favorite applications of this is uh, the progress that we're making on codec avatars. Can you talk to us about why these are so important for us and how they're working today? Sure. So the first thing I'll point out is that codec avatars are very much uh, AI. I mean, they are entirely machine learned and they are um, really a remarkable application of machine learning with tons and tons of data. So codec avatars <clears throat> consist of two parts. One is the encoder, which takes the data from the sensors and encodes your current state. And one's the decoder, which is on the receiving end, re-expands that into your avatar. And codec avatars are remarkably true to life. Um, I, I will say that I was shocked the first time I saw a really fully functional codec avatar that it's not just like a better avatar, it has leaped to the point where you feel like you are legitimately with that person. And <clears throat> you know, when I think about what, what is most key about the metaverse, the most interesting thing in the world is other people. It's always other people. And what is meta about? It's about connecting people. So the way we can do that is with Kodak avatars, you can have that genuine feeling that you're with another person. So for example, everybody has that first experience in VR where it's like, oh, I feel like I'm in this place, not like I'm looking at someplace, I feel like I am here. And we haven't gotten to that point yet with avatars where after you're done, you know, in your mind, it's like, oh, I was just with that person. But codec avatars fully have the potential to take us there. And so I think this may be one of the most important aspects of the metaverse really blossoming into its full potential, which is simply the ability to put people in the same space with other people in a way that feels fully real, fully meaningful. Yeah, one thing I've learned a lot about uh, our research work over the last uh, decade is uh, a lot of times we're making incredible progress year over year, especially when we have such a clear vision of what we're trying to build for example, on codec avatars. And sometimes that progress goes into, in the case of codec avatars, fidelity, um, into the, our ability to reproduce it. Sometimes it goes into the capture, our ability to you know, build effective models from uh, photons that captured in a sensor. And sometimes it goes into performance. One of the really exciting things that we've done over the last year is start to get codec avatars into a place where not only do they look fantastic and can they be captured effectively uh, by somebody at home, but also that they can also be used on conventional, widely available hardware. Um, and these are each, all three of these are incredibly hard problems and they trade off against each other. And uh, here we have a team solving kind of all three uh, at once uh, in parallel. And just so proud of the progress that we've made there and, and something that we hope to continue to share more with people about as it becomes more available. One thing I think is useful to think about is how often in our conversations we are referencing not just the future we're trying to build, but also the history. It's easy to overlook the history of our field. It's a relatively young field. Um, but most of us who are programming today, for example, came up at a relatively stable era of that field. Like you said, it's a pointing device, a keyboard, and a display, 
and that's it. It's all just 2D panels. Uh, in fact, I came up in the web era, and <laughs> that was the easiest era maybe of all. Uh, really write once, run anywhere kind of a time. Um, and it has been so often important for us to revisit how that era came to be when we do this technology. Um, I was hoping you could share with people what are, you've, you've actually got a great reading list and maybe we'll publish it separately, but here we are live. What are a couple of books that you think are required reading for those in our community who want to understand how we got uh, to where we are? So the seminal book, in my opinion, the book that really talks about the history from the very beginning up to the point where you can see the world that we live in kind of coming into existence is The Dream Machine. The Dream Machine is technically a biography of J.C.R. Licklider, but sometimes goes for 30 or 40 pages without mentioning Licklider. Um, because yeah, he, was, right. he was there at the beginning. Really, this world that we live in was his vision of human-oriented computing. I mean, it is shocking that so few people know who J.C.R. Licklider was, but um, he really did see the potential here way back in the 1950s. And he seeded a lot of it at ARPA when he had... Uh, a budget in, in the IPTO office at ARPA in the early 60s. And then those people got brought together at Xerox Park. And that was really where all the pieces came together. So Dream Machine is a, it's a really good read, in my opinion, but it also is the history of how this came to be. The second thing I would suggest is Dealers of Lightning, which is about Xerox Park. And it is a great read. And it really captures the excitement of being there at the beginning and creating something that has never existed before that's going to transform the world. And then the third book that I would recommend is um, Insanely Great about the making of the Mac because the Mac was really the end of the, the how many years, gosh, 37 year uh, trek from when Licklider first had his vision of the future to the point where it became a commercial consumer product. And Again, the Mac is about what it really takes to do that new thing, to overcome all the barriers, to overcome the skepticism, and to really create something new. So those three, to me, are really the, the core three books that I would recommend. I, I've read all of them, thanks to your recommendations. I couldn't agree with you more. I will add one more, which is a, a bit of a, a trickier read, but Bootstrapping, which is about Douglas Engelbart, which I'll be honest, is also one that Michael recommended to me. Uh, bootstrapping is one that I've been obsessed with lately, especially as you think about novel input modalities and who you're building for. Um, and at Stanford Research Institute, if you haven't ever seen it, uh, go ahead and do yourself the favor of looking up on the internet for the mother of all demos, uh, a 1968 demo that they pulled together um, that did video conferencing, live multi-person document editing. I mean, if you think about how long it took us to get back to the vision that that demo uh, encoded uh, that early on. It's incredible. And also, of course, it also details the ways in which Stanford Research Institute uh, didn't succeed and was ultimately, you know, the ideas that they had were galvanized at Park and not there into something that became the Alto and then ultimately the Mac. Um, because of and, and because they picked the wrong audiences to focus on. Um, but one of the things I do love about all these books, if you read them, you will realize how much uh, the very early architects of our work um, it, were very focused on human use cases. They were very focused on uh, social communication, uh, teamwork, collaboration, which have always been cornerstones of how we've thought about uh, our platforms in virtual reality and augmented reality, our investments in things like codec avatars to make those seamless. Uh, and so I think we are carrying on uh, a pretty you know, long-standing tradition in our field to make sure that these are devices not only for computing, but also for all the human work that powers it uh, over time and powers it hopefully towards more productive ends. So I wanna give us a chance to do some final thoughts. Uh, Michael, it's only fitting as this is your 10th Connect and you are historically the, the anchor uh, for this entire event uh, and we're something we're very proud of. What are you most excited about working on right now? What's inspiring you uh, as you go to work day to day? Well, first thing I'll say is I am, as I've always been, excited about all the things that we're doing because they all have to happen, <laughs> right? I mean, in the end, what I'm excited about is that that whole platform emerges as you know, the next generation thing that carries us for the next 50 years. And 
we're putting all those pieces in place, not just in research, but also in product. And I see that happening. And you can't say, well, we'll do these three, but the other ones don't happen because then you just don't, you know, imagine if uh, at Park they had invented the laser printer, but not ethernet, not bitmap graphics. Well, you know, you don't get the same thing out of just a laser printer by itself. It was really the full package of right. everything together. Um, <clears throat> if I had to pick one thing, I would say that the personalized, contextualized, ultra low friction AI interface is the thing that I find most exciting. And the reason is, you know, the way that hum humans interact with the digital world has only changed once ever. And that really was Doug Engelbark, Xerox Park, the Mac. And, you know, since then we've been living in that world. And as we move into this world of mixing real and virtual freely, we need a new way of interacting. And so I feel that that has to be this contextualized AI approach. And, you know, getting that to happen is the thing that I find most exciting. I mean, it's, it is a once in a lifetime, you know, opportunity to really change the way that everybody lives. I share your enthusiasm about all this work, and I'm so glad to continue to be doing it with you all these years later. Thank you, Michael. Thanks. <laughs>